This is the Friday, February 28, 2020 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now, Sue Martin. Hello, Sue. Hello there. Good to have you here. Thank you. We um, went through a whole bunch of things. This coronavirus has a wide array. I asked you about cattle, but I did not get a chance to ask you about feeders. Placement last week was ahead of where you probably wouldn't want it to be. We're still, you said we got a whole lot of product in the site, in the pipeline, but we got a whole lot there in the feedlots. So what's going on? Well, I think that when I look at the feeder market, uh, of course, after the coronavirus broke, you know, news was really rampant this week, a lot of your sales kind of dropped in numbers because producers were holding back, uh, hoping that next week things will be a little better. But when I look at the feeder market, it's been the leader of the cattle market for at least the last year, year and a half. Yeah, the chart shows it. I mean, it's oh, a high mover. It is. It's either taking you up or it takes you down. It leads the fats. And when I look at uh, the market here, um, I tend to think that the feeder market, you know, it's, it's a matter of when you're trying to buy feeders and you're looking at a fat market that'll correspond to when your cattle will be ready and the market's tanking, and in the meantime, you have corn prices just kind of going like this. Um, I guess that's sort of down. <laughs> I forgot that. We don't put you in the graphics department. That's How right. about that? <laughs> um, anyway, when you have that, it, it maybe makes it a little tougher sell to their banker, and they tend to kind of hold back a little bit. I'm not sure that we have a total bottom in yet on feeder cattle, nor am I sure that the low's in on fats either. In fact, I, I don't think it is but it's how we get there. Um, probably the one thing that would be a concern is to rally the cattle into about the 10th of March. If we rally into the 10th of March, that market could turn and just unfold right back down again. Um, and I kind of do look for a low, actually I'm kind of thinking it's more April than March, on the cattle market in general. So I think what I would do, now that the market has caved as hard and as fast as it has, Rather than selling the futures, I would buy put spreads. You know, you buy, say, at the money put, and then sell a further out of the money put. So that your margin is like not that great with that, and, but it gives you a floor for now. If the market continues to break, then you have to think about the one you sold down underneath the market because you may have to roll it down again and walk the market down. This leaves your upside totally open and because I do think that we're not out of line yet with this we have to keep in mind April fats did not take out last year's high when we had that big rally in you know from the fall mm -hmm. low or September low so we did not get that high out and that was a V bottom so we had trouble there and last year's market had an outside range but we closed the year higher so the last thing we want to see is it's nothing out of line that the market couldn't come down and try to take a look at last year's lows, but to take them out is going to be a concern. So what would push it higher, though? I mean, you said you'd leave your position open. What's going to push it higher? Well, I think that once we get through this, this phase that we're in, you know, by the third quarter, numbers start tightening. The one thing I was a little concerned was seeing the cattle weights this week. And last week, uh, steer weights are up pretty good against normal, and or even a year ago. And I'm thinking, well, let's see here, a little bit more numbers, more beef production. That's not what we need when you've right. got everything else happening. So I tend to be, I think that your last half of the year is going to be better than, than probably what a lot of people feel like it's going to be at this time. All right. Let's do this, Sue. Let's take a couple questions. We always get good ones that come in via Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. This one came from Jonathan. He's Farmer John 52 on Twitter. He's asking, what price level makes growing cash grain unattractive and acres leave grain for other crops? Well, when you're looking at on corn, you have to be looking at soybeans. And corn right now is more profitable per acre. So I would have to say, you know, and basis comes into play here, and basis has been a good driver here, been a good, you know, it's been tight. Um, but I would have to say if you took 
corn futures through 330. I think traders will and but you know you can have these spike downs and then they come back out. I think it would have to take a little more than just a spike down. Um, when I look at the corn market and I look at this and I always thought that the January we had a higher high and close the month lower on corn. That to me was telling that we were going to probably take out the January lows. Well, that happened this week. But in the meantime, I look at the corn market and one, the call options have not been falling comparable or as fast as you would think on the calls. That tells me there's demand there. I was say, this do you market. smell something cooking there? Yes. <laughs> and in the meantime, I look at uh, the charts going back and looking at September corn, for example, because if the weather forecast is right for what I'm looking at, then traders are probably going to, if they're replacing corn, they might want to be in the September futures. I wouldn't go all the way to Dece because you're paying for time you don't need to. Uh, but the September will allow you to get into August if you needed to. But I think this is a year where you want to be able to hang on. And if you buy July futures, what's happening? You're going to be forced out in June. And that might be a hair too soon this year. So I think when I look at the September futures, I noticed that the September contract last year expired at 358. We had a huge gap there. The market's working on coming down and trying to fill that gap. We've got probably another 15 cents to go under this week's lows. All right, let's talk about Canada. We have a shipping strike up there. Uh, Ruben in Wisconsin's curious about it. He's, like, he's asking, will the disruption in Canadian shipping possibly help our markets? And he's saying especially dairy. Is that the one that benefits first? I think it and will. And maybe most? Yeah, I think it will. Um, I think that the U.S.-Mexico-Canadian agreement is a very important thing for dairy people. And so I think, yes, the shipping has been having a problem in Canada. They've got to, you know, fully approve the U.S.-Mexico-Canadian agreement, but that'll get done. And so I think the dairyman's outlook is actually looking better than it has been. They'll um, take that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. And they deserve to have it. Um, when you look over in China, um, you know, they're looking at, expanding, getting their herd back up to speed. And that takes a lot of time. But as they have these pigs, baby pigs, they're going to feed them a more nutritious feed. It's kind of like you buy a puppy, you give it a better puppy food that's more fat and what have you. And whey comes in, dry whey plays in a part into that. And Sean could tell you that yes. too. And But um, I guess I would just have to say that I think the dairy man's days are going to get better. But I also believe agriculture as a whole, I think, is going to get better. At, I think we've turned the corner. We've got corn and soybeans both into a seven and a half year cycle low due. It was kind of depending on where you started the count from. It could have been February, but it could take us into March, and I think it will. Um, but I do look for some major lows to be made here. Well, what do you have to do to get those cycle lows made? You've got to be moving down into them. So, and that's what's happening. All right. That is something we'll watch, and I think people would love to see uh, who are benefiting from selling some grain at some highs, not some lows. Uh, Sean was here talking about last week a three-and-a-half-year uh, high on dollar. This week, John in Santana, Kansas, is asking, what is having the most influence on the export markets? Is it coronavirus? Or is it the dollar strength? Now, the dollar for the week finished lower, but we're still in, in very high territory. Yes, we are. In fact, that dollar got up in the well into the 99 level. And, you know, the 100 mark, the last time we had a high was 101 something, just shy of 102. So the dollar is having an impact, especially on wheat and possibly on corn. Soybeans, um, right now, the South American farmer is probably blissfully happy in Brazil because whenever they have a dollar that's been running up and the real going down, that is like a pay raise for them. So they're having a good time. Yeah. Um, you know, someone else's, it's kind of like someone else's junk is someone else's treasure. Our adversity is their, their pleasure, I guess. It's, it's um, when I look at the market here, I think the dollar rally has been having a little bit to do with it. And yet, when I look at uh, export sales to China, they're up about 3 million metric tons from where they were at this time a year ago. 
Still, if you look at the five-year average, we're about less than half of what they were or should have been or averaging. So, you know, the dollar does come into play, but then the coronavirus has an impact because of why the wa tariff waivers go into effect su a Monday, Sunday night into Monday. Right. All right, I'm going to ask you one question, last question. Of all the markets that we've set low, is there anything that has set a low and we're going to go higher? Is there one commodity in particular that you think the low is in because of coronavirus? That's off the question sheet and I didn't prep you for it. My apologies. Oh, uh, no, that's fine. Um, doggone. I'm going to say hogs. Okay. And then is there one that you think has more low to go? Well, there are a lot of them, I think. Um, I think that the cattle still has more to go yet for a low. Uh, I think that, um, but, and I think that soybeans got to watch because if we roll through this week's lows next week, it could take us down to 854. That's the low you're going to look at. 872 will be your first stopping point on the May beans and then 854. Um, and last year's low was 780. So you could still have correction and not be so worrisome. Mm. Wheat is loaded long, record long. And so and while beans are short, soy meal was record short and it's trying to turn. So there are some moving parts here that could be positive for the longer run. I think the key here is more so time. When will this thing run its course? And I truthfully think by the time we get through March into April, we're turning that tide and this market's going to be seeing a rally in, I, I believe we're going to have a much better rally than people are giving us credit for at this time. We'll have a scorecard for you when you come back in the spring. How about that? Hopefully it's not an F+. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Appreciate Thank it. A-plus performance today. Thank you. That will do it for Market Plus. We appreciate you watching it, listening, or however you consume it. Join us again next week on the TV program when we'll explore how a diverse set of Western stakeholders, and we'll also talk, uh, we'll talk about Western stakeholders when it comes to the grain markets, but we're also going to talk about coronavirus and how that thing has been playing out in the commodity markets. And we'll have Elaine Cub on the program to break down the markets at the market to market table. Until then, thanks for watching, listening, or reading. I'm Paul Yeager. Have a great week.